tonight, we're going to be hosting a guest speaker, Professor Barry Latucci from Brooklyn College, to be giving a lecture on fascism in Europe, particularly speaking about the contemporary crisis in Ukraine. Comrade, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. I'm very honored to be with you again tonight. I don't know if everyone has seen that article by Yuli Dubovic. I don't know if people have seen this, but it's really a must-read article by a Ukrainian refugee who really lays out the story of the more recent history of how the U.S. has generated this war against Russia in the Ukraine. He talks about both the coup in 2004, what was called the Orange Revolution. He is really a refugee from Ukrainian fascism, I would say. He really lays out this story, how the U.S. brought the government to power in 2004, despite the fact that they had lost the election and then did the same thing again in 2014, which everyone is much more familiar with. The Yanukovych government, which was democratically elected, was overthrown in a coup that was spearheaded by fascist forces like the Azov Battalion, the Svoboda people, and so on. And this, and he very aptly describes how Zelensky has flipped 180 degrees from his campaign promises for having peace with Russia to becoming basically a puppet of U.S. imperialism. It's a very fine article. I hope people get a chance to read it because it's really the best article I think that's been written on this whole crisis. I mean, what I was talking about last time on Tuesday night was, of course, the whole history of how Ukrainian fascism came about. Dubovik's article is good because he also talks about the fact that Ukrainian fascism just represented a minority view among the Ukrainian people, a majority of whom fought against the Nazi occupation and fought with the Red Army. Nevertheless, when you have the backing of imperialism, whether it's German imperialism or American imperialism, and remember, Hitler was a continuator of German imperialism, you have a disproportionate amount of influence over the political situation and over the military and the intelligence services, which is the case today. The fascists, the neo-Nazis in the Ukraine are the spearhead of both the military operations and the intelligence operations and have a stranglehold over the government, even though they represent only a minority of the population even today. Dubovik's article The only thing I would say is a little bit soft on fascism, because I grew up with the slogan, death to fascism. That's the slogan I grew up with, and that's the slogan I believe in to this day, and I'll always believe in it. I think we have a really dangerous situation. I come back today from my class after having discussed with them how the United States slipped into the shoes of German imperialism after World War II and violated every international law and international agreement. We shouldn't forget that the United States and Britain signed the Moscow agreements, which led to the Moscow Declaration of 1943, which it led to the creation of the United Nations, but it also guaranteed that Nazi war criminals would be extradited to the countries where they committed their crimes and prosecuted. The United States and Britain violated that, and from the very start after World War II, brought these Nazis in develop them as contacts, and it's all in now declassified CIA documents. So you can find it, for example, in this document, Cold War Allies, the Origins of CIA Relationship with Ukrainian Nationalists, which not only does it explain in detail how the CIA cultivated the Nazis from World War II, the Ukrainian Nazis, but also explains that they were CIA assets, and how the United States actually sent covert operations into the Soviet Union after World War II. This was an invasion of the Soviet Union, an actual invasions. And I think that we're in a very difficult situation right now because the United States is pushing for war against Russia. There are segments of 
the political elite who want war with Russia. If there is war with Russia, that means the U.S. is pushing for nuclear war. Can the U.S. win a nuclear war? Do we want to see a nuclear war? This is why it's so urgent for all of us to speak out, to speak from the rooftops, from the mountaintops, in the streets against U.S. NATO military aggression against Russia in the Ukraine. The U.S. and the U.S. media is inciting war. This is a war crime in itself. And we have to be very clear and we have to be very militant in telling people, everybody, because nobody wants to die. Nobody wants a nuclear war. Nobody wins a nuclear war. How do you explain how the people will continuously buy into the propaganda? This is a very different situation than the weapons of mass destruction, but they constantly buy into it. And they know that it's nonsense. Trump's whole support thing was fake news. And with the $30 trillion national debt and $100 trillion corporate debt is a global conflict, the only thing that can save capitalism. The first question has to do with the fact that the corporate media and the whole media landscape in the United States is so totalitarian. They use the word totalitarian against communism. But this is the real Orwellian totalitarianism because there is no questioning the line of the imperialist powers, NATO, the United States. And that's not just in the United States. That's across the world right now, wherever NATO and the United States are the dominant players. So this is a monolithic thing. And that's why I say it's so important for us to get an alternative viewpoint out there And actually, that's the beauty of this article by Yuli Dubovic, because he isn't speaking like a hardcore Marxist, although the people who posted it described him as a left-wing Ukrainian. He's really speaking like a peace activist, but he lays out all the facts, the truth about U.S. military intervention and really the bloodthirsty vampirish military aggression against Russia that's going on right now. The more I think about it, the more I realize this is a crisis of capitalism. This is a crisis. I'm teaching a course on globalization. One of the books that we were reading is this book by Joseph Stieglitz, who was one of the promoters of globalization. And he's a Nobel Prize winning economist who knows globalization better than anybody. But he says that 100%, not 90%, not 95%, 100% of all the profits of globalization have gone to the multinational corporations and to the financial institutions. In other words, to one-tenth of one percent. And now, where are we economically? We're in a global stagnation, and the crisis was pushed by U.S. imperialism to try to break through this economic stagnation and try to capture the Russian market, the Russian resources for multinational corporations. It really is a stark and harsh reality of the global capitalist imperialist system at work. What do you think the interim goal for the capitalist is here? Because I would think that nuclear war would even be unprofitable for them, but I would think that they would try to do a continuation of many proxy wars, Ukraine obviously being the first and biggest, and then probably several throughout that region and around the world against other nations to increase arms sales and that type of thing maybe even trying to avoid using U.S. troops to keep from receiving backlash from middle mainstream America. Do you think that sounds about right? Do you think they have a different type of goal here? Well, you have to understand that they have always prepared for nuclear war, and they don't give a damn if we die. They have their own bunkers underground for the Washington elite, for the financial elites. They will all be safe in the event of nuclear war. They will all be saved. We will all die, but they will all be saved if we were attacked by nuclear weapons. They have planned this out. I've seen these videos of these places. In fact, I think it was on 60 Minutes once that they showed us where the top maybe 50,000 leaders of the country would go in the event of nuclear war. On the other hand, what you said is also true. Certainly, if they do go for nuclear war, 
they would probably be going on the assumption that the U.S. would not be attacked, but they would be able to destroy Russia, that they would somehow be able to intercept the missiles. Of course, we don't know what North Korea would do. We don't know what China would do. And so there are other countries with nuclear weapons. It is true that it's certainly not the Biden strategy to go for nuclear war. The realists who were in power under George W. Bush and even Clinton favored a more aggressive stance. But since Iraq and Afghanistan, the more realistic point of view has been to go for proxy wars and to pour in billions of dollars of weapons to destroy, destabilize, and undermine our capitalist imperialist enemies, that is, or the enemies of imperialism as they're viewed. We must stand with Russia here because Russia is not the aggressor and because NATO is the aggressor and Russia that resists against NATO and against a puppet regime that is openly Nazi is very positive for any communist, for any even socialist, the real ones, progressives. How could they stay neutral? How could they say that both are imperialist and we don't take side? That is wrong. You end up being on the side of NATO. And we know that Russia is not socialist. And we sure want it to be socialist and back to the SSR. But in the meantime, we need to fight NATO. We need to fight fascism. And they are doing that. We must stand with them. Today is March 17th. Well, 31 years ago, there was a referendum in the USSR by nine republics. And the question asked was, you want to keep USSR? The answer was 77% yes in nine republics. Now, six republics, they boycotted, you know, the Baltics, obviously, and Moldova and Georgia and Armenia. The average for USSR was 72%. In Ukraine, it was 70 In the west of Ukraine, like in Vol, the Bandera home Galicia. Galicia, three oblasts of the west Ukraine. It was 80% against USSR. That tells you the story right there. When you went over the scenario of wars, you forgot about Yugoslavia there. Yugoslavia is a close parallel in many respects. The 78-day bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, just to give one example, wasn't the only bloody imperialist crime that was committed, but they killed dozens of children and not to mention men and women, civilians, in that 78-day bombing. About a few days into the bombing, they declared the president of Yugoslavia, who was a socialist, Slobodan Milosevic, as a war criminal. And at the end of the 78 days, they sent in a Finnish former foreign minister to tell Milosevic that if he did not stop fighting, that they would level Belgrade with two and a half million people and kill everyone. This was a threat of genocide that is part of the public record that the United States gave to Yugoslavia in early June, I believe, 1999. Then they split up the country. They took Kosovo and they took it out of Yugoslavia, out of Serbia, even though it had been part. So they talk about not changing the borders of Europe, but they did that themselves. And then they tried to erase all of this. And then in 2000, the CIA overthrew Milosevic in a very similar type of coup as they engineered in 2014 in Kiev. And this is public record. It's public knowledge. Even the New York Times Magazine had an article on how the CIA organized this CIA organization called Otpor, or Uprising, to overthrow the Milosevic government. And then they sent in U.S. and U.K. and NATO soldiers in disguise to kidnap him, and they brought him to The Hague. And when they couldn't convict him because the facts were not there, there was no proof. It was totally bogus charges on everything. And I was the only American to testify in his defense at The Hague Tribunal. He was essentially murdered by not giving him his medicine. He had very high blood pressure. 
they knew they couldn't convict him, so they had to murder him. And so NATO killed Milosevic in the Hague prison. So that's what they would like to do to Putin, too. These are lessons we have to learn. These are lessons because they're very enlightening for what the U.S. is doing right now. You brought up Milosevic. Wasn't he ultimately exonerated after his death by the tribunal? He was more or less acquitted, yes. But exonerated is too good a word for what they did because they didn't apologize. By the way, all of these lies were thrown at Milosevic, the ones that they're making against Putin. For example, they claimed he had billions of dollars in foreign bank accounts. This was so ridiculous on the face of it, but people believed it. And they're believing it about Putin, that somehow Putin has all this money stashed away somewhere. The history books that are written by the mainstream academics all portray Milosevic still as a war criminal. So despite the fact that he was never guilty of anything, never convicted of anything, the lies persist. Although a lot of textbooks nowadays simply try to disappear everything that happened in this decade called the 1990s, like the 1990s didn't happen. The U.S.-NATO wars of the 1990s didn't happen because we can't really explain them properly anymore. And it's better for people not to know anyway. With all the Russophobia and general Slavophobia that's going on in the United States right now, how do you think this is going to impact Russian Americans, Ukrainian Americans? I've even heard Georgian Americans talking about how this is discriminatory against them. So how do you think that this Russophobia and Slavophobia is going to affect the general population and U.S. Russian relations in the future? I think it's a major step forward for racism in general. Among the people that the Nazis killed in the Soviet Union, we talked about the Jews, we talked about the Poles, especially murdered by the Ukrainian fascists, because there was a conflict over territory. And in fact, the Ukrainian fascists who were cultivated in Germany during the pre-war period assassinated Polish officials, even as early as 1934. And of course, they murdered Russians who historically have been viewed as the enemy by German imperialism and German racism. And they created this Ukrainian nationalist movement to oppose people who are actually the same, you know. They created a Catholic-oriented uniate church to try to split the Russian Orthodox people religiously also, as they did in Yugoslavia with the Croatians and the Serbs. Before I forget, it's unfortunate that these people are forgotten, the Romani people. The Romani people are black-skinned Europeans. People don't know about them. They're called gypsies. But if you go to Eastern Europe and you meet Romas or Romanis, they are black-skinned people with their own language, have lived in Europe for more than a thousand years, and who are such an ultra-oppressed racial group. So when you hear about Africans being racially attacked by Ukrainians in Ukraine today, bear in mind that they have already a history of attacking Roma people too, so they don't like Black people. But keep in mind, Russia and the Soviet Union historically supported African countries in the anti-apartheid movement and African Americans in the struggle against racism and Jim Crow segregation in the United States for the last hundred years. Africans know that. We stand with the people who are under U.S. imperialist assault, and in this case, certainly Russia. Remember that the U.S. policy was always containment. George Kennan was the architect of U.S. foreign policy after World War II, which was contain Soviet Union and China, and one day we will conquer the Eurasian continent. But for the time being, we're going to put them under sanctions. Containment meant sanctions. It meant economic blockade. It meant starvation. It meant economic strangulation. And that's what the U.S. and NATO countries are trying to do to Russia today. And they'll do it to China again tomorrow. What I am seeing in real time we are seeing the vehement bastardization of Putin. There's a few articles going around mentioning his super yachts or his vast fortunes. 
you can see it in real time with how applicable this is. Another observation I had was we are seeing in real time the collapse of the petrodollar and seeing Biden kind of try to scramble to remedy this. And we're seeing his oil source, Saudi Arabia, in talks with China and talking about going over to the yuan. So I think this is really, really interesting to see the imperial superpower with his back against the ropes finally and trying to bounce back and see what it can muster up. How is Biden going to kind of start his proxy wars or how is he going to try to get his way into combating Putin or using NATO in a way to get this going? Because we all know what's going to happen. The crude oil has obviously been spiking over $100 a barrel recently, and it's obviously going to keep going up from there. And as we've seen with the consumer price index, it was 7.5 for January, and now it was 7.9 for February. So I would anticipate that it's going to keep increasing, and American taxpayers are obviously going to be footing the bill. So I just want to know the comrades' perspectives on that. The economic side, which you raise, is very important because we have to remember that the one tenth of one percent that runs this country that profits from capitalism doesn't give a damn about us. And they're prepared to wreck even our lives and much of the rest of the world in order to destroy the government in Russia and then to take over as much as they can. There's an old song from my generation from Depeche Mode, the grabbing hands grab all they can, all for themselves after all. That's from my generation, Depeche Mode song. So they don't care if we have an economic recession, if there's unemployment, if people can't afford even to go to work. They don't care that a large percentage of the wheat in the world will not arrive in the Arab countries, in the African countries, and that they may starve to death there. That Egypt with 100 million people could see mass starvation and rioting that Nigeria with 200 million people could also be on the verge, Ethiopia with another 100 million people, all on the verge of severe crises because of U.S. imperialism. And that's why we should bear in mind what happened with Yugoslavia. When they couldn't bomb the Serbs into submission, they threatened genocide. That's when Milosevic had to surrender. He had nobody to back him up. Maybe China will step in. I don't know. That could change the whole dynamics. I'm glad Barry brought that up. Very important point. During the Vietnam War, we went through the same thing. And it was a plague on both your houses. That's what it was. A plague on both your houses. Meanwhile, objectively, let's remember what Lenin said. Subjectively and objectively objectivity that Lenin talked about. And I'm going to give you a famous quote by Lenin. There is no third way. They try to present that there's a third way. It's either socialism or barbarism. There is no third way. The third camp actually ends up killing the communists and the anti-imperialists. Those people are dangerous to us, actually. And they're not part of our movement. They're part of liberalism. That's what they're part of. They kind of have an ideology of liberalism. Oh, I'm too pure. I'm Pontius Pilate. I wash my hands in this. By Pontius Pilate washing his hands at the time he did, he, in effect, sealed the death of Jesus Christ. He could have stepped in, but he washed his hands. I'm too above this. Dubovic's article is really so good. He talks about this a little bit, about how under globalization, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United States government, which is behind all of this, as well as the weaker Western capitalist countries, the first thing that they did was they broke up nationalized property forms and grabbing it for themselves and for the oligarchs in the West. And that's the target. That's why nationalized property forms, in a way, that's a way of protecting the resources, even though it may not necessarily be progressive in every aspect, it does represent a way of preserving resources and industry and not allowing the large-scale capitalists and the financial institutions and multinational corporations from dominating those resources. 
And that's precisely what globalization is trying to do. It's trying to break up whatever nationalized assets there are and to put them in the hands of the multinational corporations. By the way, in the United States, they try to destroy small private farmers that way. Agribusiness tries to destroy the small private farmer and take the land away from them so that they can drill into the ground and produce food uh, large scale at cheaper prices and more profits, and meanwhile, destroying the ecology of the land, as well as destroying our aquifers. So anything that is nationalized, actually, nationalized state industry or state property is actually progressive via V, the capitalist system. The capitalist system is determined to put it in the hands of the multinationals. Now, you may be a worker cooperative person, but Yugoslavia was based on worker cooperatives. But you see, the worker cooperatives were also an alternative form of socialist organization that represented a large segment of the Yugoslav socialist economy. And along with the nationalized sector, it was more than half of the economy. That's why they destroyed Yugoslavia in the first place. The multinationals drive the imperialist system. They drive globalization. And they're driving the whole war drive against Russia right now. And this is why you should read the Yuli Dubovic article, really, because he explains that this happened in the Ukraine, too. The West's contribution to the current crisis right now is that eventually by supporting the pro-Yeltsin government, who later appointed Putin, and where Putin meant with Bill Clinton and other officials, Bush, quote-unquote, looked into his soul. Essentially, this is a little bit of a similar incidence to when we supported the Manuel Noriega government, who eventually did not take up to Washington's orders and eventually was automatically turned into a dictator, despot, etc., where beforehand he was the beacon of the free world, so to speak. And we might add also. When we think about Latin America, when we think about South America, Central America, let's not forget how the U.S. sponsored its own proxies there. They were called death squads. You know what they did in Argentina. They just took leftists, they brought them up to a few thousand feet in the air in helicopters, tied up, and they kicked them out of the helicopter. And then they took them to the stadium and they executed them. And they took babies and they took them from their mothers. And those babies never found out who their parents were. Now it's so far away what happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in Central and South America, including in Chile, where we backed the Pinochet dictatorship. These were terrible war crimes. You want to talk about human rights? I'm all in favor of human rights. But the imperialists are the biggest violators of human rights, the biggest genocidal war criminals of all time. If you want to really understand how globalization works, you could look up the term Washington Consensus. The Washington Consensus was first promulgated at Bretton Woods in 1944. However, after the Soviet Union was dismantled, they created a second Washington Consensus, which was even harsher and called for the breakup of state-owned property, reducing living standards, fewer social benefits, its deregulation, Etc., 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 all in the effort to help Western multinational corporations take over the whole global economy, control the global economy, and bring down living standards of working people everywhere. The fact that the US would fund fascists and neo Nazis and things like that, a lot of liberals like to think that that's unbelievable, something that right. we wouldn't do. We've been doing this since Operation Gladio with the stay behind armies. In Europe. And so, especially in this context, when we're talking about Russia, I mean, it's something that NATO and the US have always wanted. They've always wanted to get to Russia and to conquer those Eastern Europe countries. It's kind of terrifying when you read about what they're capable of, especially in this instance where we're seeing the proxy war going on right now. It's like we haven't even touched the tip of what could happen in this situation. Before the crisis began, I had heard the last four presidents, including Biden, bring up China. China this, China that. Terrible, terrible. We have to contain China. 
I saw a debate between Yanis Varoufakis and John Bolton, the old war hawk from the Bush administration, who also served briefly under Trump. And all he could say was China this, China that, where Varoufakis was talking about other things. And so is it a safe analysis to say that the capitalist countries were already fishing for war with China and they even started an economic war with China and blamed the pandemic on China? And then this crisis in Russia presented itself. And I think they stumbled into it, which is why Putin mentioned even that the nuclear option was on the table. And I believe also that this is a capitalist crisis. And you're seeing what happened, I think it was yesterday, where the Federal Reserve raised the interest rates for the first time in a very long time. And that the spokesperson even said that they had a plan to do it six more times within one year. Would it be a safe analysis to say that no matter what, they were fishing for a major conflict? Yeah. Look at the countries that we sanction to strangle them economically. One of them was Venezuela. We do have an oil crisis, by the way. It's not correct to say we have plenty of oil. We do actually have a supply crisis, and that's not going to be remedied by fracking our way out of it. And the U.S. became so desperate that they actually negotiated with Venezuela recently to allow shipments of oil from Venezuela. So how is it that Texas oil is going to supply us? Can you imagine American imperialism going to Venezuela, of all places, to ask for oil? This is pretty pathetic. This is really pathetic. And it shows the weakness of the U.S. global supply chain right now. We are in a capitalist crisis. There's no question about that. China and Russia are on the carving board. They were accused of genocide, China, right? This is all an effort to strangle and undermine the Chinese communist government and also the socialized property forms in China. About why the capitalists would take the side of the U.S. and then support the sanctions on Russia. And my answer to that would be that Comrade Stalin on the national question mentioned that the bourgeoisie actually can't hold nationalistic characteristics. That would also explain why capitalists here in the United States are supporting sanctions. Next thing would be, going back to Comrade Stalin's foundation of Leninism, is that there is a silver lining to this, which is imperialists can't help themselves but start wars. When they do that, they also weaken themselves. I want to very much thank Professor for joining us. We had a really, really good discussion on contemporary fascism in Europe this week. And I really, really hope that we can have the professor on in the future to dive into more specific topics. But I want to remind you all that the People School for Marxist-Leninist Studies is the current manifestation in the long line of party-sponsored schools in the United States. We come from the tradition of the Jefferson School of Social Science, the Center for Marxist Education, the People's School for Marxist Studies. So the People's School for Marxist-Leninist Studies, the environment that we are in now, is not just an idea someone had a couple of years ago, but rather it is the continuation of carrying the torch of communist education in America. Without further ado, I want to give the floor to Comrade Angelo to finish up the presentation. I want to just clarify something. It's an interesting conversation. Nationalization of industry. We have always seen it. We as Marxist-Leninists, as communists, have always been for it. However, We've warned that it's not enough. That is, I think, what other comrades are referring to. Nationalization will not bring us socialism. It's the first step. That's all it is. And the first thing that happened in 1959 in Cuba was they nationalized what? You remember what it was? They nationalized a couple of things. The sugar industry and the oil refineries and things like that. And that was enough for the U.S., that was when the blockade happened. It happened then, right after Castro came into power and they nationalized. Number two, Venezuela, the first thing they did was nationalize the oil and they put it under the government. That's a positive thing. However, we agree with the party in Venezuela. As long as you just do that and you don't go further and you leave the media in the hands of the capitalists, 
and you leave the truckers in the hands of the capitalists, you're creating a future problem. Remember, the truckers were the ones in Chile in 1973 who started the whole movement against Salvador Allende. It was the independent truckers. Remember that. And so, therefore, it's not enough. The enemy of nationalization has always been the opposite, privatization. And we as communists have always been opposed to all privatization, always. Mexico in the 1930s, you should all know this, under Cardenas, C-A-R-D-N-A-S, nationalized many of the industries in Mexico, and it was attacked by the U.S. because of that. Gulag in Brazil in the 1960s, the same thing. So the capitalists hate nationalization. We say it's not enough. It's a first step. That's all it is. The second thing I want to mention, which was brought up here, and it reminds me of all my years in the CP, which I don't regret any of those years. I learned a lot. The crisis of capitalism. We're going through another crisis of capitalism. I suggest you get a great book by Comrade Gus Hall that was written in 1970. Some of you may have it already from Valerian books. It's called The Crisis of U.S. Capitalism Today. It's a small book written by Comrade Gus Hall. And this is something Comrade Lenin spoke about many times, the crisis of capitalism that we go through. So it's important that that word that was brought up by Comrade is important. We are going through a crisis. And if nothing happened with Ukraine, they were already talking three months ago. Three months ago, they were talking about raising interest rates. Three months ago, because I was looking to refinance my mortgage, and that's how I knew about what was going on. And I just did it before this whole thing happened. I just want to bring that to everybody's attention, that this is nothing new. We have to understand this is going to happen. And our job is to try to use it to the advantage of the working class, to overthrow an exploitive system, which we all agree on this phone call is exploitive, and that's called free enterprise, which is not free. It's really called capitalism and brings us closer to what we think is going to solve our problems. Socialism was not the end. Socialism is the tools in which we can deal with the economic situation. But the end for us has to be communism. And that has to be understood. That is our goal. Thank you for listening to this full-length class from the People's School for Marxist-Leninist Studies. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, and Instagram. Join us on Discord. Support us at newoutlookpublishers.net and visit peopleschool.org to sign up for free classes.